Hey guys, we're going to pick up with slide 14 uh, in chapter 1 lecture notes. Okay, so that's where I'm looking at here. Um, so in the, in the last set of notes, we learned that you can categorize elements based on their sort of properties, right? So an element is the simplest form of matter. You can combine them. Um, to make compounds. Okay, so two different elements would make a compound. So for example, if I take hydrogen, two hydrogen, and one oxygen atom, this would make water. Okay, so that's a compound. Um, elements and compounds are both pure substances. You can envision the pictures we talked about in class to help you with that. If, if I have a mixture of just elements, the picture would look something kind of like this, right? All one color, all sort of separated from each other but close together. So this is an element that would be a solid, most likely. Um, for a compound, which again is also a pure substance, we would have, you know, so two hydrogens for each water. And then of course one oxygen. Let's get our oxygen in there. Okay, so this is a compound. These are both pure substances because the only particles, the only objects I have are identical, right? So here in, you know, this mixture, I have just water. In this mixture, I have just a bunch of oxygen hanging out. Both of those are pure substances. On the other hand, if I have a situation where I have two different elements in one space, we call that a mixture. So for example, the blue one could represent, I don't know, carbon. Okay. And maybe the yellow one's going to represent sulfur. This is a mixture, which is different. It's two different elements. They're not close enough together to be bonded, to be one particle. These are separate particles hanging out in space. So that's different from a compound. If I was going to make a compound out of these guys, then I would have to draw them really close together like this. Overlapping even. Okay, so this is a compound. And this one over here is a mixture. So compounds are pure. Whereas mixtures aren't pure. You have to have two different things, two different distinctly separate objects to be a mixture. Once you've decided that something is a mixture, then we learned how to categorize it into heterogeneous or homogeneous mixtures. Okay. Okay, so going back to elements. Elements are the simplest atoms. So simplest atoms. You can't get any simpler than that. You cannot break them down. You can't, um, yeah, you can't get anything simpler than that. Atoms are sort of the most elementary particle. Um, there's 118 distinctly different atoms and they're different. Each one is distinctly different because they have a different number of protons. Okay, so protons are one of the things that make up an atom. Okay, only 88 of the elements actually occur in nature. The other the other elements are all man-made and not usually present in, in very high amounts. So where in nature do elements get made, you might ask? That's what I would ask. The answer to that is in the heart of a star. So over here you can see we have this lovely picture from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, this image is an exploded star and each color represents a different atom. So here where you have the blue, that's probably hydrogen. And here's the red is, you know, it could be a lot of different elements. Maybe it's, maybe it's calcium. I don't know. Green could be copper. So all these different colors represent distinctly different elements, which again, elements are different from each other because of the number of protons that they each have. Um, so the way it works is in young stars like ours, our, our sun is very young. They start out with hydrogen. And so it turns out hydrogen is the simplest of all of the elements and it hydrogens only have one proton each. So 
if I take two hydrogens and I put them in a star where it's really, really hot and there's a lot of pressure, they're going to smoosh together and form an atom, an element that has two protons in it. If we look at the periodic table, we can find the atomic number. And the atomic number is the bolded number on the upper left corner in, in our class periodic tables, the green ones. Um, two protons is the atomic number number two is the element helium. Okay, and as the star gets older and older, so this is over billions and billions and billions of years, we have a young star, so it's still burning hydrogen, but other stars run out of hydrogen and then they have to start burning helium. So you take two heliums together, right? So two protons plus two more protons is gonna give us four protons. So what element on the periodic table is that? Put your answer, put your answer on your notes here. Okay, so you're looking for the one that has the atomic number four. Okay, and so this process keeps going on and on and on. You keep smashing atoms together and making new heavier atoms until you get to the element Fe, which is iron. Iron is really, really heavy, really dense. And so once you have a star made out of mostly iron, it explodes. Okay, so here's an example of an explosion. It may not be that this star made it all the way to iron. I don't know. It depends on sort of the circumstances, the pressure, the temperature, all this stuff. But it's possible to get all the way to iron. And then when the star explodes, all those individual elements get scattered across the universe. And if you're really, really lucky, the elements are going to condense down and become a, a star. And then even more elements from other stars are going to collect together and make a planet. And if you're really, really, really lucky, that planet might have oxygen and hydrogen on it and water. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, how Earth came to be. So ultimately, all of the elements that are in the Earth, on the Earth, everything made out of matter, which of course is, is half the universe, the other half is energy. All of those things ultimately were created in the heart of a star. So that's pretty cool. There's a quote, a great quote from Carl Sagan that says, we are all stardust. I really like that one. Because ultimately that's what we are. All the, all the atoms that make up our bodies came from the stars. Okay? They're long dead now, but that's good for us. We get to use the elements. Okay. So that's where elements come from. Only 88 of them occur in nature. The other elements were man-made, and there's not very many of them. We do need to be familiar with these elements so we can talk about them. So we're going to use atomic numbers 1 through 20 for a quiz, okay? And so the quiz is pretty straightforward. All you've got to do is two types of questions, okay? So the first type of question is going to be where I give you... Hmm, I don't know why that C did that, okay? I give you the name of an element and you tell me the symbol, all right? Or the other type of question is going to be the other way around. If I give you a symbol, you've got to be able to tell me the name. Okay, so you're going to get a quiz on Wednesday that looks something like this. It's going to be five questions of each. So five of these and five of these. And so if the quiz says carbon, I'm going to write the letter C. That's the symbol for carbon. If it has the symbol calcium, I'm going to write the word calcium. Okay, so that's what you've got to do. Only for atomic numbers 1 through 20. Okay. Now, it's really important to notice something about the symbols. Okay, so the first letter is always a capital letter. And the second one, if there is one, not all of them have two letters, like carbon is just one. But the second letter would be a lowercase letter. This is really important because it's the difference between the compound carbon monoxide, CO, and the element... Cobalt. Okay. Cobalt's really pretty. It's it can be purple and it can be shiny, uh, purple and when it's a compound. Uh, but it's really a cool thing. It's making you know, if you've ever seen that blue glassware that's kind of popular in upstate New York, uh, that is often made blue by using cobalt in the glass. That's very different from carbon monoxide, which is a compound, and that's what kills you if you inhale a lot of car exhaust, right? So very different. Cobalt, pretty cool to put into a glass, 
not to drink necessarily, but to make the glass pretty. Um, and carbon monoxide, not so much. <laughs> Okay, so make sure you're very diligent with how you capitalize the elements. The symbols are very specific. Okay, and then something else to watch for is spelling. Um, so let's go a few, through a few elements. For example, this symbol is for the element phosphorus. Oops, oops, oops. Now I need an eraser. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The element phosphorus is spelled a little bit oddly, so make sure that you practice this. Okay, a lot of people want to make it O-U-S, but watch out for that. It also gets confused quite often with another element, because they both start with P, so sometimes people can, can get a little confused by it, but potassium has been known for a really, really long time. It's a metal. and so its its symbol is named for what it used to be called in Latin, but they're different. So the symbol for phosphorus is P, and for potassium it's K. Don't mix them up. Another one that often gets mixed up is sodium and sulfur. Sodium is Na, and sulfur is just the S. Okay. Um, also, another word about sulfur, something kind of funny about it is that in other countries that speak English, we spell this differently, okay? So in Britain and um, and I think Australia also, they have a tendency to make it PH in the middle there. That is not the correct spelling in the US. So I have to grade you on our spelling in the US. You'll find a list in the back of your textbook. They all have the correct spellings and symbols there. You only need to know elements one through 20 don't memorize the weight or the atomic number or anything like that. It's literally going to be questions just like these. Okay, so make some flashcards and get studying for that. Okay, so when the first chemistry textbook was ever written by, by a guy named Lavoisier, he was a Frenchman, he categorized things into just two categories, metals and nonmetals. Okay, so metals are, well, you probably have an image of what a metal is in your mind. They're shiny, okay, they're conductive, meaning that if I hook a battery up to them, it'll, electricity will run right through it, or um, heat runs right through it, okay? So, like, when you touch a piece of metal, it feels cold to you because the heat is leaving your hand. They are also what we call malleable. Malleable means you can turn it into a sheet or roll it up into a ball or whatever, you can form it into different shapes, kind of like Play-Doh. And ductile means I can form it into a wire. So that's what metals are. Non-metals, on the other hand, are exactly the opposite. Okay, so if, if we write non-metals over here, it's dull, not shiny. Um, they're not conductive, they are not malleable, and they are not ductile. So if I try to take a non-metal and, and like form it into a sheet, you know, like a sheet of metal or something would form, the, the non-metal is just going to turn into a powder. It doesn't, it doesn't stay together. Um, oh, so that's a good thing to remember. They're kind of powdery often. So for example, you've probably seen non-metals before. Carbon is... Uh, like charcoal is a non-metal. And if I tried to form charcoal into a sheet, it would just crumble, okay? So that's the difference between metals and non-metals. Now, we needed a way to organize the elements. In Lavoisier's textbook, there weren't very many elements to categorize. So he was all right with just like sort of a loose description of the two categories. But later on, De Chantois came up with this idea of um, making kind of a cylinder and organizing chemicals by how they react with each other. Okay, so for example, if, if I take, hmm, let's say if I take lithium, the element lithium, it's atomic number three, symbol Li, and I add it to water, which is an element, you know, it's this not a, sorry, that was totally wrong. It's not an element, it's a compound. It's the simplest compound on the earth. We use it for so much. So water, if you take water and put lithium with it, 
you get fire. Huh. So that's interesting. Here's lithium right here on the De Chantois version. If you follow this line um, that lithium is on, you'll see that sodium is also on it. <coughs> it turns out if I take sodium and put it with water, I get even more fire. I know it's a very sophisticated picture of fire, but you get the idea. And if we keep tracing the line that sodium and lithium are on down, we see there's potassium. So if I take potassium and I put it with water, I get way more fire. Now this is weird. Now imagine, you know, you, you expect fire to put out, be put out by water. But in this case, if we put any of these metals with water, they catch on fire. That's weird. Okay, but that's reactivity. Flammability or reacting with water are both chemical reactivities. So this periodic table from De Chantois organizes the elements into what we called at that time families. And so a family reacts the same way. So the family, lithium, sodium, and potassium, all explode in water. Okay, so that's the idea behind the periodic table. We're trying to organize the elements by how they behave. Lithium, sodium, and potassium are on this version of the periodic table. Instead of going horizontal, uh, vertically, like up and down, like Deschantois did, now the families are organized horizontally. So this periodic table was published, was suggested by a man named Newlands, John Newlands, and um, it wasn't very well respected, but what was interesting is that there's these nine categories of, of families, nine families, basically. And I think one of the reasons it wasn't very well respected is because he said, oh, gee, there's nine families and there's nine musical notes on the music scale. So they must be related. Chemistry and the musical scale are related. And nobody really knew what to do with that. It doesn't. It doesn't help further science in any way, so he was kind of ignored for a long time. But as it turns out, we do use some of these categories in a slightly different way in the modern periodic table. The modern periodic table was invented by Dmitry Mendeleev down here. Uh, his story is really fascinating. I'm going to have you guys watch a video, a PBS series all about it. But um, the reason Mendeleev is, is called the, the father of modern chemistry is because of his invention of the modern periodic table. Okay, and so it too organized chemicals based on how they react. So you can see that the lithium, sodium, and potassium are back to being vertically organized. He called this group one. We still call it group one to this day. All right. Uh, the reason he put them in this group is because they all reacted the same. So does rubidium. So does cesium. So there's more elements in Mendeleev's time than there was when Deschantois was looking at it. But the beauty of Mendeleev's periodic table is that he organized it by reactivity, so the groups are the reactivity, and he organized it by increasing mass. So if we go across the rows here, carbon has a mass of 12. Nitrogen is 14, oxygen is 16, okay? And when he organized it by both mass and reactivity, something really cool happened. It turns out we have eight groups, not nine, but eight groups that everything falls into. And the, the beautiful thing that happens here is Mendeleev realized that there would be, there were missing elements that we didn't know about at this time. So all these little dashes are empty places, places where there should be an element, and we didn't know about them at the time. Whoops, I went backwards. We didn't know about it at that time when Mendeleev was making the periodic table. But he left the spaces on the periodic table anyway. And he was, he was so convinced of the beauty of the periodic table and the periodicity, meaning the patterns, that he quite accurately predicted the properties of many of these missing elements. Things like what color they were, how dense they would be, what temperature they would melt at, all these kind of properties he predicted. And eventually, many, many, many decades later, we found all these elements and more, more than he thought of. And it turns out that his predictions were within 10% or less of 
the actual properties of the elements. So that's pretty impressive to predict something you've never seen or no one has ever seen on, on the planet and know everything there is to know about it. That's pretty cool. Okay, so this is a summary of those three categories that we use in modern periodic tables. Lavoisier's idea of metals and non-metals still exists today, okay? You know metals, of course, copper, silver, gold, platinum. There's many, many more, but non-metals, carbon like charcoal, uh, you might have seen phosphorus is the, the white and the red part of a match. So you've seen that before. Sulfur is a bright yellow solid, it smells terrible like rotten eggs basically. Oxygen's an invisible gas, so that one's kind of kind of unique, but they're all non-metals. They they don't they're not shiny, they don't conduct electricity, etc. Metalloids are a combination of metals and non-metals. I'll show you where they are in the periodic table momentarily, but so for example, when we look at silicon, silicon is not conductive, but it is malleable. So it's taking the non-conductivity of a non-metal, but the malleability of a metal, and it's all in one element. Okay, so the, we're gonna go back to this version here. The metalloids are easy to find. They're in purple on this one, but there's only six of them. So we have boron, oops, boron here, silicon here, germanium, arsenic, antimony and tellurium. Okay, so all of those are the non-metals. You'll notice they're kind of easy to find because they all touch this staircase here, okay? So there's our staircase. That's written in on every periodic table. Okay, so almost anything that's touching the stairs is a metalloid except aluminum. Aluminum is a metal, so don't get that one stuck in there. There's only six metalloids that we have to know, okay? So, Another thing we have to learn about is diatomic gases. Okay, so on a slide a few minutes ago, it said that elements can be monatomic, mono meaning one, right? So these are some good prefixes to know. Mono means one, di means two. So diatomic is two atoms. So we have elements, these are all elements. Okay, that's important, we need to write that down. These are all elements because in order for something to be a compound, it has to be made out of two or more different elements. And these aren't, these are just the same element connected to each other. So you can visualize this as one hydrogen atom bonded to another hydrogen atom. That's what a diatomic element looks like. All of them kind of look the same. Um, nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, iodine, chlorine, and bromine are the other these are our seven diatomic elements. So the reason this is important is when we go to write chemicals later, if I say fluorine to you, when you write it into a chemical formula, it has to be written as F2. Otherwise, the reactions are gonna be really, really difficult to, to balance out, okay? So here's how we can remember the diatomic atoms. There's a couple ways, actually. One of them, if you're a physical learner, so here's just like a little sketch of the periodic table, okay? Uh, if you're a physical type learner, this might work for you. Find nitrogen on the periodic table and make a seven. Okay, so it goes nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those six elements are diatomic, and then the other one, which doesn't fit into the seven is hydrogen, okay? So that's one way you can remember it. Another way is with this little mnemonic, have no fear of ice cold beer. So the first letter of each one tells us what the element is. So that's one way you can remember it. This mnemonic is helpful in another fashion because it actually tells you what the state of matter is. Okay, so for like example, ice, ice is a solid, so is iodine. I2 is a solid at room temperature. Beer is, of course, a liquid. So is bromine at room temperature, okay? The rest of these are all gases. So we need to memorize this. We need to know these elements. So when I say oxygen, you automatically think O2. Okay, so flashcards might help you out with that. This is a very old version of the periodic table, but it's got a lot of information in it. I can tell it's old because it doesn't have the newest elements down here. 
in it. Okay, these are the ones that were sort of discovered more recently, but um, this information is still valuable to have. So group one is this one, family one, okay. They all react in a similar way. These are the ones that when I put lithium, sodium, potassium in water, they explode. Okay, we call those the alkali metals, not hydrogen so much. Hydrogen's kind of kind of odd because it has one proton. It doesn't really behave correctly. But when we're talking about the alkali metals, we're really talking about lithium and, and on the, all the rest on that row, not hydrogen. The alkaline earth metals are the ones in green. So that's actually group two. And they all behave in a similar way. These yellow ones are the transition metals. The pink don't have a special name. They're just, you know, metals. The blue here are called non-metals, okay? So those categories are still used to this day. Some of the non-metals have special names. So most importantly, the noble gases are the 18th group right here. So the last, the last column, they're all the ones shown in red. And then the 17th group has a special name that's not shown on this figure, but we need to know. It, they're called halogens and also halides, depending on the context. Those are two sort of synonyms for the same thing. They refer to the elements fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Okay, So like you might have heard of halogen light bulbs for your car. And that's because they have some of these trace elements in them. Okay, So another thing that this periodic table tells you is the state of matter for each element. Okay, so black is the most common color for the atomic symbol. That means that solid is the most common state of matter for elements. The red ones, um, there's only a few, but cesium is one of them, mercury is one of them, gallium, and bromine, we already said was a liquid. So, and then there's a few gases. So the noble gases, of course, so all of group 18, and then also ni nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine. Those are diatomic elements, right? So this actually occurs in nature only as N2, O2, F2, Cl2, okay? And then of course, hydrogen is a gas too. Now, one thing that's interesting is that we have this row down here, which is shown a little differently on every periodic table, but there's always two rows down here. The top one is called the lanthanide series these days. So we're gonna just change this a little bit, IDE. And the bottom one is called the actinide series. Okay, the reason for that is that they fit into the regular periodic table where lanthanum is. So here's LA, lanthanum. Um, and then the actinide series fits in with actinium. Okay, so that's where the, the names for the series come from. You can always follow along with any periodic table, no matter how it's kind of organized by watching the atomic number. So here's 56 and lanthanum is 57. This one's 58 and then 59 and it goes all the way through to 71 for lutetium here. And then it connects back to the main block in the periodic table with element number 72. So really this, this row kind of belongs right in here. Okay, now what's interesting, the reason that we do this basically um, so the actinium series belongs here because it goes 89, 90, and then all the way through to 103 down here and 104 picks up right there. Okay, so now what the reason for that is because if we printed the periodic table with these, the actinide and lanthanide series where they actually belong, then the paper would have to be really, really long or the print would have to be really, really small. So it's not very convenient. So instead we, we pop them down below the main main elements in the periodic table. Okay, so um, your version of the periodic table that you'll be using on your tests and so forth doesn't have these colors on it, okay? But they're easy to find. All you gotta do is, is look for the staircase. The staircase divides everything up, okay? So those six elements that are touching the staircase, not aluminum, but the other six are metalloids. Everything above the stairs, non-metals. Everything below the stairs, metals. Okay, the only exception to that is this hydrogen is actually a non-metal, but it hangs out over here because it only has one proton and we have to put it there, even if it doesn't really fit in very well. Okay, so 
this is a little summary. We know that metals are shiny and conductive and all those things we talked about. They are mostly solid except for cesium and mercury. Those are liquids. Non-metals are kind of crazy. They can be solids, liquids, and gases. Okay. Um, there's a lot of diatomic elements in the non-metal category, so we need to remember those and pay attention to it. And then we have the six metalloids, which are like a weird combo of um, metals and non-metals. They're all solids. Okay. Now, I also want to bring to your attention some elements that are critical in biology because this class is focused on um, allied health fields. So the most important elements in human biology are shown here in red, hydrogen, not just human, by the way, animals use the same elements that we do, so do plants. But hydrogen, carbon, we're a carbon-based life form, which means that most of our molecules are formed on a carbon backbone or skeleton. We'll learn more about that, about carbon chemistry in Chem 112, but for now it's important to know that carbon is an important element in the human body. Also, so is nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Okay, so these are the you know, basically the six most important elements by, you know, if you could count every single atom in, in the body. The next category, the next down is, is this grouping of metals, okay? So they're to the left of the staircase, so those are metals. They don't exist in the body in, as elements. They actually exist as ions. So we're going to learn what that word means pretty soon. But um, they run sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Keep your brain working, your muscles firing, um, and your heart pumping. So they're really important in, in our bodies. Also, cl chlorine. Chlorine kind of balances out because these are going to be positively charged ions. Chlorine is a negatively charged ion. So you kind of have to have a balance in the human body. You can't have all positives or negatives. Or every time you touch something, you would, you would shock it. Okay, and then finally the last category is what we call trace elements. There are things that you need a little bit of in order for your body to work. So for example, um, iron is used to carry iron, uh, sorry, to carry oxygen through your bloodstream so that it can get to your brain and your organs and so forth. It's used in other places too, but that's the most uh, prominent place. Zinc is used in some of your immune response. Silicon, believe it or not, is also used in your body. Fluorine, iodine. Iodine is really important for thyroid function, for example. So people don't get as much thyroid disease anymore as they used to because table salt has iodine in it. It used to be that if you lived in certain parts of the country, you didn't get enough iodine in your diet, you'd be really, really weak and sick. That's not the case anymore. Although rich people have started to use sea salt, which does not have iodine in it. And so you can actually get more thyroid problems um, if you're just using sea salt. So pro tip for the day. Okay, so these are the elements that are in biology. So they're really important to be aware of them. And um, that's going to wrap up our notes for chapter one. As usual, if you have any questions, please send me an email or come into my office.